place different than anything you've ever experienced. Here, the magic of the movies comes to life right before your eyes. And it all begins just inside this gate. At the Disney MGM Studios theme park, guests gain admission to a dream factory, where the working film and television studio creates entertainment destined for the world's airwaves and movie screens, where a theme park built in the style of Hollywood's heyday ushers guests into a world of classic movies and movie characters. You'll think you've stepped right through the silver screen. It looked like my kind of joint. The Art Deco architecture and the Hollywood landmarks made me feel at home. But still, I had questions. Who built this place and why? Maybe she had the answers. <laughs> Lucky for me, she was all ears. They were hammering, they were nailing, they were building. Oh, it was unbelievable. Hundreds of them. She knew the big cheese who gave the orders. She knew the gang who carried out the plans. She said her name was Minnie, but her memory was Maxie. Names, places, and dates spilled out of her like the jackpot on a nickel slot machine. She knew more about this job than your dentist knows about your mouth. Yeah, it's a story with more twists than a taxi dancer. So listen tight. And I'll tell you what I know about the Disney MGM Studios theme park. According to this scale, I am six miles tall. Now that's 12 miles from here up to here, and the whole area encompasses 27,400 acres. That is 43 square miles, twice the size of the island of Manhattan. In 1971, Walt Disney World opened its gates. 1982 gave the world Epcot Center. And with the 1989 premiere of the Disney MGM Studios theme park, the Disney Company unveiled yet another masterpiece of imagination on the huge canvas of its Central Florida property. I think you get a double whammy if you shift them out a couple of feet. Yeah, with the about that, so we need to get a height on that and see if there's any trees that would do that. Six months ago, I walked through this place when it was still dirt and things were just coming out of the ground and we were in the midst of all the, the working drawings and all the budget compromises and all the things that you go through. And I took, up to the, I took a trip up to the Magic Kingdom and walked through the hub area of the Magic Kingdom. And when you look at the hub area of the Magic Kingdom and the castle and all the architecture and everything, it's a scary thing because you know that the, that the precedent that's been set here and at Disneyland is extremely high. It's extraordinarily high. And so the weight that you suddenly feel is you've got to be as good as that or you're disappointing the whole reputation that Disney has. What used to be all 60 to 70 hour weeks have grown to 80, 90, 100 hour weeks as we try and do all of the finishing touches. We try and make sure that everything is perfect. I don't think you can work this kind of job and not be proud of what you're going to do and not take a great deal of enjoyment from it as well to realize what you're doing that five million guests a year from now and forever are going to enjoy. It's a working movie studio open to the public. It's a theme park built in the best traditions of Disney entertainment. It's a happy mixture of old Hollywood and new technology. And wherever you look, there's evidence of someone's good idea come to life. It's theatrical, it's fun, it's entertaining, it's everything that Disney stands for. It's got a little bit of me in it, it's got a little bit of uh, all of our uh, new executives in the company, plus uh, a lot of everybody that's been here. I don't think anybody else has the resources to attack quality the way we do. Uh, most people take shortcuts for either economic reasons or because they're lazy. You know, most people take shortcuts because they just don't know how to do it right. And this company has such a history of not taking that shortcut, going down the path uh, that is the hardest, the toughest, the most painful, and the most expensive to gain a quality that, that is fun to be around. 
The street performance, the architecture, the movie soundtrack playing in the background. Yep, somebody had hijacked Hollywood, moved it from a state of mind to the state of Florida. It was the kind of job that could only be pulled off by Imagineers. It is the equivalent of Disneyland's and the Magic Kingdom's Main Street, a fantastic thoroughfare that lets you know immediately you've crossed over into another place in another time. It's pretty exciting looking at all the different architectural work that's around. And you get to see a part of Hollywood. If you don't go to California, you can see it in Disney World. It's incredible. Nothing like this in Ohio. There wasn't anything like it in Florida either. This is how the site looked in April of 1987. The only thing that distinguished Hollywood Boulevard was the crater that would become Echo Lake. Then came the armies of men and machines. I would characterize as war. Everything's happening at once, and the only way that you can control an operation like that is with a lot of sort of military organized skill, and that, that's what happens during the initial process of construction. The Hollywood Boulevard that Disney Imagineers created was an idealized avenue, dominated by the energetic architectural styles of the 20s and 30s. They studied the Art Deco buildings of Hollywood, some have been restored. Some have suffered through years of careless modification. Some are hidden or overshadowed by the urban sprawl around them. We would go down to Hollywood and just drive all over the place and look at neighborhoods where the studios were located. If there's anything that's characteristic about it, it's that optimism and exuberance and the bright sunshine and the orange trees and the palm trees and things like that. There's some facades here which, which do not have any real um, real equal on the outside world. They're inspired by the period. Again, the research was so well done that the designers understood the period so well that they could replicate these facades as if they were back in the 20s and 30s. Min and Bill's Dockside Diner and Gertie the Dinosaur paid tribute to another type of Southern California architecture, California Crazy, characterized in Los Angeles by food stands shaped like giant hot dogs and donuts. And Hollywood's Crossroads of the World was the inspiration for the five-and-a-half-story Crossroads Mickey at the park's entrance. Longtime Disney sculptor Perry Russ fashioned this Mickey as he appeared in the 1930s, with one slight difference. Mickey's right ear is copper, because at 55 feet above the ground, it's the highest point at that end of the boulevard, and therefore has to double as a lightning rod. Without a doubt, the grandest and most ornate building on Hollywood Boulevard is the Chinese Theater. It's our castle at the end of Main Street. In our case, Main Street is Hollywood Boulevard. And the castle is a Chinese theater for, you know, that was built in the 19, late 1920s in Hollywood. As the home of the great movie ride, this Chinese theater differed in construction from its predecessor in that its roof was built separately from the building and hoisted into place. That was a very exciting time for us as we had to maneuver a very large structure that it is, weighing 22 tons, maneuver it around inside the courtyard, uh, which was already crowded with this large 150-foot crane that had to lift it into place. It sits within a half inch of where we expected it to sit, and uh, that's not too bad considering the size and, and weight of the thing. It's not something that's easily worked with. Architect Brock Tommen spent two years studying the original Chinese theater in Hollywood to ensure that the Disney MGM Studios version would become a faithful reproduction. We've photographed this extensively and various artisans and craftsmen are, are reproducing this and we'll, we'll have the doors just like they are here. One of the pieces that we've spent a lot of time and effort to reproduce are these Chinese uh, foo dogs that are actually carved out of stone and we have sent photographs of these uh, to vendors in China and they are carving some to match these exactly. Many, many man hours by many, many people have been spent checking into the historical background of this building and trying to make it as authentic as we can. 
Another part of the original Chinese theater, perhaps the most famous part, required more than cloning. That's the forecourt, where since 1927, Hollywood's greatest names have left their foot and handprints. The Disney MGM version? Bring the stars to Florida and do it all over again. All right? Okay. All right. All right, here we go. This world-famous Hollywood tradition found new life at the new Chinese theater. This is my street, Hollywood Boulevard, the street of dreams, where everybody has a shot at being a star. Now, do like this. Oh, Jungle Boy, I have searched the planet, okay? Oh, Jungle Boy, I've searched the planet and found you in the metropolis. And looking at this place, we really have a, a living movie set on our hands. And we have, as the entrance corridor, D Hollywood Boulevard. And here would be a terrific place to take all of that, what was so far disparate energy of little acts here and there, move it down onto Hollywood Boulevard and do what I like to call the Streetmosphere program. With Hollywood Boulevard as their fictitious home, a colorful troupe of 1930 street performers interacts with the guests. You use the guest and you let them be in the show, and if you feed them an opportunity, a line, and they don't say exactly what you had intended for them to say, it doesn't matter. Whatever they say is right. You know what was in this cab last week? Who? Errol Flynn was in this cab last week. I don't believe oh, it. Sat right I, don't the seat. I don't oh. believe it. I think I you're... Know. To cast these flamboyant citizens of Tinseltown, the Disney Imagineers held auditions in major cities across the United States. With the Streetmosphere program, as you're working just right off the guests in the park, even though you're working from a script, there's a great deal to be said for the performer's personality, for what my uh, psychologist friends call being immediate, being right there, right now with those people. This is my first monologue, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I've never done one of these before. <laughs> Send him to wardrobe, Crocker. Should we send him to wardrobe? The characters give life to buildings. We've always done very well at Disney and specifically at Imagineering, creating places that have a great look. But now we give those we give those places really a life. Well, hi, how are you? This is I'm Sid Kawenga. This is my shop here. We call it the one of a kind shop. I still got. We got it. A little anxiety because I want to see it all blown out and I know that the actors though we've trained them it takes them a few days to see that the little tricks and the rules of doing street theater really do work to trust those rules because they're different than some of the things that some of the rules they've played by in traditional theater come come clearly do it like this go up and down and breathe from your diaphragm while you're doing it that'll help come on like breathe from here up and down Isa, up and down if Isa, a dog sitting on a seesaw Isa. I found evidence that implicated many well-known citizens in the conspiracy to construct the park. <sighs> yeah, the prints were everywhere. And the trail led right here to the Chinese theater where I got taken for a ride, the great movie ride. On opening day, Thousands of guests witnessed the opening of the great movie ride at the entrance to the Chinese theater. They would soon be among the first to experience the signature attraction at the new theme park. Kill my sister. Was it you? The great movie ride is a spectacular tour through the greatest scenes of some of the most beloved American movies ever made. That's a mighty tough territory you're heading into, Pilgrim. The legendary stars, action, and dialogue of Hollywood classics are immortalized through state-of-the-art Disney audio animatronics. I don't get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. Ah! But the road to this Oz was a long one. It started four years earlier in Los Angeles at the conception of the Disney MGM Studios. The Great Movie Ride was the first um, concept that came out of our initial thoughts on what we would want to do with this project. The concept led to preliminary drawings and models, which led to the creation of the sets. Clay sculptures led to creation of the molded plastic audio animatronic figures. Artists created huge scenic backdrops to support the illusion beyond the sets. Then, all the scene elements were tested for effectiveness in Los Angeles by groups of company employees. The first tram starts coming in when the music that you're going to hear starts, and it stops. 
Um, and then the second tram is coming in, and they all are here when the witch appears. And then, as the munchkins tell you to get out, <laughs> they everybody leaves. So. Finally, all the great movie ride props, figures, and backdrops were crated and shipped cross-country to Orlando, where they took their meticulously pre-planned places in the 90,000-square-foot Chinese theater building. Supervision of the colossal project rested on the shoulders of show producer Eric Jacobson. I felt like a, a blind person feeling my way through this because there's so many things that I've had to act on intuition through, but I've received such tremendous support from all the people that have, have their expertise or these other technical areas that I don't know very much about. That's the neat thing about this organization is everybody helping everybody else. Another key player in the great movie ride team was computer programmer Doug Griffith. He's been animating the audio animatronic figures through a series of computers and controls that um, brings them to life. Um, and he's actually responsible for being sort of the acting coach for our stars and our uh, assorted uh, cast members. I did look at films and try to get a feeling of, of what that person's personality was, uh, pick up on little gestures that they did. Uh, from there, I would take that and try to do those in my program. One of Doug's best performances was his programming of the witch from The Wizard of Oz. Margaret Hamilton playing the Wicked Witch of the West in this show is one of the most technically advanced audio animatronic figures that we've built. It could move much faster and st stay more stable. Plus, it's a figure that has the most movement. With lavish attention to detail, work continued on all the sets simultaneously. Hundreds of mummified extras were positioned to haunt the corridors of the ride. Workers refurbished the original plane from Bogey and Ingrid Bergman's final scene in Casablanca and painted the trees in Tarzan's jungle. Mary Poppins and Bert took to the rooftops of London and some nightmarish creatures were invading the spaceship Nostromo. We debated a long time about horror and sort of the violent side of the movies, and we didn't want to leave that out, you know, so we sort of selected the most horrifying movie monster that we could think of. And so we said, what would be creepy about this? What would give them that feeling that even if they hadn't seen the movie Alien, that they would understand what the message was? So we decided the creature coming out of the, out of the ceiling and reaching down to grab them would be kind of fun. They built the best of the westerns here, too. A cowboy showdown which the Disney artists produced precisely right down to the Duke's belt buckle. Everyone I spoke to about the film knows exactly what John Wayne wore. You know, they, they, you can't de deviate. The belt buckle was requested by the family because after he had made Red River, he never wore any other belt buckle in, in any of his western films. The Wayne family said it was beyond their expectations, and uh, we were delighted because I think it was all done with a great deal of integrity. If you got good sense, you'll turn that fancy buggy around before it's too late. With the Duke standing sentinel, the trams of the great movie ride move into a frontier town shoot 'em up. In this scene, there's a, a bank robbery which is staged with audio animatronic figures and a live actor. Uh, portraying a bank robber, and this is one of those rare reality and fantasy kind of mix. Get down! The bank, get down! And the bank robber, in a very melodramatic and also a little tongue-in-cheek style, um, takes our tram and us with it to, to make his escape out of the town. So many of these movies that we're recreating are so special and dear to so many people's hearts and, and so many childhood memories. The challenge was to take something that was seen through the eye of a camera and could have been very uh, one-sided and create an environment that people can go through and feel like they're in the actual movie set. I knew this world of mine couldn't go on forever. The illusion, like all great movies, had to end somewhere. And that somewhere was right here, 
the entrance to the backstage tour. This was where the illusion gave way to, to the reality of how those movie illusions are created. Now this is where the Disney MGM Studios backstage tour begins, where you can watch actual television, motion picture, and animation productions in progress. This gate is the backstage doorway which lets guests in on all the secrets of the movie trade. Action! <laughs> This fully equipped studio complex can accommodate everything from major stunts to major stars. La, la. In June of 1988, the new studio was dedicated and Hollywood came to Florida in a big way. There are three state-of-the-art sound stages totaling close to 30,000 square feet for film or television productions that require an indoor location. For productions that take place outside, a residential street was recreated in various architectural styles. Here's the Golden Girls house. And there's no need to travel to New York. Here's a city street location so authentic it rivals the Big Apple itself. It's really been a wonderful collaboration between every aspect of of the company and the most exciting thing is is that we really have a, a full working production facility. We've created a state-of-the-art motion picture and television studio that rivals anything in Hollywood and with that kind of support structure anyone can come down here and make a movie or a television product competitively with Hollywood. Uh, cut, cut, great, perfect, perfect. The new studio offers one-stop shopping for filmmakers it has the world's largest costume department, an animation studio, a videotape facility, and much more. We've got over 200,000 square feet of shops, for instance, and they can build anything from a, from a full-fledged monorail or a steamboat down to a hand prop. Uh, we've got a 200-acre tree farm that substantially outdistances most greens departments. Uh, we can cater, we can transport, we can house, and we claim that equals the best studio in the world. But a working studio is only part of the story. For the first time ever, visitors are invited to watch the production as it actually happens. We have a, a tour corridor where our guests are able to actually see the work. That's never been done before. It's that blend between the tour function and the production function. But everyone is committed to achieving both goals. So far, we've been extremely successful in creating the blend. Accommodating the functions of both the backstage tour and ongoing production required a team of industry experts. The sound stages were the brainchild of Milt Foreman, a premier stage designer in Hollywood for over 40 years. What we had to do was design a stage that could efficiently and easily service film production and television production without compromising the needs of either system on the back lot, the New York Street presented a different set of challenges. How do you make a series of facades seem authentic? First of all, the street needs to appear as if it's surrounded by a big city. Those tall buildings at the end of the block are really only paintings, creating the three-dimensional illusion of a skyline. To help us understand further, we spoke with a couple of giants in the industry. Come on, come on, come on. Hi, I'm Gary Marshall, film director, and this is M. Mouse, one of Disney's top executives. We look a little silly standing here, but the further and further away we get, it becomes more and more real. This is just one of the fascinating things about the illusions of filmmaking. This technique is known as forced perspective. The buildings are designed from detailed scale models. Murals are then painted on giant canvases. Finally, they are brought to the location, hung on towers, and weatherproofed. So the backlot street looks like New York, but sometimes a production might want it to double as another city. Both the Chrysler and Empire State Building are removable if, if somebody wanted to take them out of the shot because they wanted this to be Chicago or, or some other era. But what really makes New York Street so authentic is, once again, that painstaking attention to detail. I'm responsible for getting the character look or the age look. We're trying to get this street look back in a period of 50, 60 years old of, of old New York. 
These mailboxes get, get what we call an aging treatment. You can see there's several different colors on there. That they've been used, look like they've been beat up, the paint's chipping off of them. They, they've been really been here for a long, long time. They're rusting, they're starting to fall apart. Well, they're, as they are, they're really relatively brand new, but they will create the look that the company wants to give you, that we've been in, in New York for a long time and being used. Since the studio opened, numerous productions have made use of the sound stages and the back lot. But the first movie to make full use of all the studio facilities was The Lottery, starring Bette Midler. I want New York, New York! The production illustrates how back lot and sound stage locations combine for maximum efficiency and control. Even though we've had a lot of production here, the Bette Midler shoot, I think, was the first time that this place really felt like a movie studio. There were cars and stuntmen and, and uh, special effects people. And you realize that, that we did really create, in addition to creating Hollywood here, we really created a movie studio that works. You can make movies here. You can gather the resources necessary to do pretty extensive work on, on the New York back lot or on the soundstage. So that was probably a very exciting turning point for the studio where it really became a legitimate place to work. Explode! Perfect! Cut so far we've done, for the Disney Channel, a Carol Burnett special, which was kind of special. It was a conversation with 750 people in the, the stage where she interacted with the group. Uh, we will become the home of the new Mickey Mouse Club, which is the, the 1990s version of what we all, or many of us, grew up with in, in the 50s. Now this is Sound Stage 3, the new home of the Mickey Mouse Club. It's one of the stops on the backstage tour. Let's go in the back door. It's an updated version of the show that put Disney television on the map in the early 1950s. Just as their predecessors did, these Mouseketeers reflect the style and attitude of their times. They've come from all over America to join the jamboree that's happening on stage three. Twelve young people who are as talented as any you'll ever see. The first. They're the members of Disney's new Mickey Mouse Club. Of course, that doesn't get them out of doing homework. They take a full load of classes to keep on track academically. And when they're not hitting the books, chances are they're memorizing a script, learning a new dance step, or the lyrics to a new song. There's no place where you can hide. Their intensive schedule meant that the cast got to know one another in a hurry. Turns out they have more than mouse ears in common. But we all get along so well because mainly we have the same interests and we have a lot to talk about, you know, and it's, it's just so easy. I really would like to get into owning my own business, but if this progresses and really goes, I'll probably stay with this for a while. This, this, I like this pretty much. This seems pretty fun. The world would be a much better place. Boy, please. The new Mouseketeers were selected from over 5,000 hopefuls who auditioned around the country prior to the park's opening. By the time the park opened, the show was in full production and instantly became a hot stop along the backstage tour. The Mouseketeers keep stage three jumping with guidance from adult co-hosts Moeva Pryor and that model of responsible behavior, Fred Newman. Waiters brought the check. <laughs> Nice door. Hey, you rang, ma'am? See you real soon. Why? Because we like you. The names and faces may have changed, but the song remains the same. You know, I love that guy with the white hair. <laughs> His high-pitched voice belonged to Walt Disney, but it wasn't long after his birth in 1928 that Mickey Mouse belonged to the world. From Mickey's rubber-limbed beginnings, Disney animation grew into a totally original American art form that was soon in demand all over the globe. In creating these masterpieces, Disney's artists drew on what Walt liked to call the illusion of life. 
When Mickey Mouse jumped off the drawing board, the art of animation and the name of Disney were forever linked in the minds of moviegoers. Now here at the theme park's own animation studio, you can relive the history of cartooning, and you can look over the shoulders of Disney's master artists. As they pass through the portals of the animation studio, guests on the backstage tour gain admission to the heart and soul of Disney. Here, the illusion of life is born, as these artists create animation using highly specialized techniques which have evolved over half a century. The guests, meanwhile, are breaking new ground. Our foremost uh, objective here was to create a real studio that the guests could come by and really see in operation, where, where we don't consider ourselves an attraction as such, although that's indeed what we, what we are to the guests. We're a fully operational studio. We've opened our doors and let them come in and, and watch our artists at work, but what they're seeing is, is, is a real studio. To ensure that the animation facility could accommodate the needs of the artists and also entertain its guests, Disney employees were asked to test the studio while it was still under construction. Because guests move through at their own pace on a self-guided tour, traffic flow was a major concern. It'll be interesting to see what happens once the first cycle and once we start that again to do the eight minutes what those people will do to affect these people okay. moving along. Well, let's do that. Just, just to load them right up. People in the, in the, in the car can we recycle that quick enough to just you load them in? Roll sound. Hit. Hey, camera speed. C2, take three mark. Background action. And action. This is Walter Cronkite here at the Disney Animation Studio. The production of Disney animation is a paradox of sorts. It requires precise planning as well as unbridled creativity. For a nine and a half minute film explaining how the process works, Disney paired some unbridled cartoon characters with the very precise Walter Cronkite. I say when I went to the movies for the first time, there were always four parts to it. There was a, there was a cartoon, there was a newsreel, and there was a comedy, and then the feature film. And uh, I think I went mostly for the animated cartoon. The people around uh, Disney seem to acquire a certain aura of, of the of, the, of Neverland itself. Uh, there seems to be a great good humor about uh, about the work. A, a joy to be, if you please, a joy to Disney, if maybe is what it is. Uh, it, it's it's great fun. I, I like it. I grew up with that feeling that Disney films meant basically meant a fantastic emotional experience. I mean, everybody knows that the quality is there, and that's mind-blowing. The main thing was an emotional feeling that you take away from it, an enchantment, a magic, uh, a warm feeling that you'd want to go back to. We know that in its location in the studio tour at uh, Disney World, that it's going to stand for a long time as sort of the introduction to animation for a whole generation of new animators. And so we just knew we had to do a really good job. Thank you for joining us here at this special dedication, The Magic of Disney Animation. The dedication of the new studio signaled that it was ready for both guests and animators. Visitors watch artists draw the characters, then follow the production step by step through Xeroxing, inking and painting with paints that are custom mixed at the studio, and final photography one frame at a time with the appropriate background art. It's a process which has changed little in 50 years. I think it's uh, an art form that's experiencing a rena renaissance thanks to films like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Oliver and Company that there is a renewed interest in, in, in animation. And certainly Disney is doing more animation now than ever before in its history. And it's where this company has come from in its past of, of, of an animation background and we strive to continue to meet those very high standards that were set in the early days and indeed with modern technology to exceed those, those standards and make better and better animated films. Our immediate involvement here in Florida is, of course, these shorts, which I mentioned earlier, starring Roger and, and, and Baby Herman. Um, they're going to be six-minute films that are going to be released in front of uh, Disney movies. So the first one has just been released, which is Tummy Trouble, and we're on the second roller coaster Rabbit, and that'll take us a six-minute film, and it'll take us about seven months to complete. 
For most of their careers, they were known as the Nine Old Men. It was Walt Disney's nickname for the most talented of his animation staff. Four of the Nine Old Men were in Orlando for the new studio's dedication. And more than anything else, the presence of Ward Kimball, Mark Davis, Frank Thomas, and Ollie Johnston made the opening official. We were influenced by a guy named Disney. I mean, Walt, he acted and he uh, was a great storyteller. And you have to have somebody like that who's kind of uh, has the vision of what you're trying to do. It's like being an apprentice, a violin maker or, or a silversmith or something. You just can't go to school to learn it. It's something that you learn on an apprentice type of uh, working environment from experienced people. We all trained under uh, animators before we were actually animators ourselves. Quite honored to be surrounded by such heavyweights. The magic had been passed on to a Little new generation. Now, think of the happiest thing. It's the same as having wings. Let's all try it just once more. Look, we're rising off the floor. Jim and me. Oh, my. The potential of a place like this, well, it's something I say to our animators when, when they start, is that for all our guests who come through here, the years to come, that this building will be sort of synonymous with, with Disney animation. Our guests will look back at this place and say, this, oh yes, I know what Disney animation is. I've seen it at the Disney MGM studios. And therefore the responsibility of the artists who work here is enormous to perpetuate that, uh, the, the, the spirit. A tram tour zigzags through the backlot area where all the ingredients of movie making are on display. This mechanical monster is Judge Doom's dipmobile from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Like almost everything on the backstage tour, the dipmobile is the real McCoy. Toons beware. Guests never know what celebrity they might bump into. Here, Herbie the Love Bug pops up with an encore from his film performances. The tram eventually finds its way through every phase of film production. With over two and a quarter million garments, this wardrobe range... There's enough here to occupy anybody's imagination. We have designed a tour that that is a combination of walking and ride and some of it's guided and some of it's self-guided. I, I think it's also the first time that we've done a, an attraction that has the scope and scale of this backstage tour. The self-guided phase of the tour allows guests to explore the production area at their own pace. They can stay as long as they like and see as much as they want. The blueprints for the Disney MGM theme park have their origins in old Hollywood. But the true genius of the design is the way it gets guests involved. Some attractions, for instance, are designed to bring out the hot dog in people. Now behind me is the monster sound show. It's basically about sound effects. <laughs> 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 This is the place where audience members get the chance to become Foley artists or sound effects engineers. A team of first-timers watches a film without sound effects. Then, with devices as old as the talkies themselves, they add wind, rain, fire, and thunder to the mix. Timing is crucial to the reality of the picture. And the audience has the last word. Here we go. Oh, more sound. You know what's great about this place is that you can get in on the action. Like right here at the Superstar Television. You can walk through that door, a virtual unknown, and walk out. A star. Please, please, no photos, please, no, 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 please, 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 no, 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 no. 
Through a process called automating, members of the audience get superimposed into a TV variety show and other classic television scenes, such as a situation comedy and a cowboy hero riding into the sunset. Anything's possible in superstar television. We interrupt this special for a special bulletin. We go now to superstar anchorman Frederick Newman. Elsewhere today in a remote oil-filled ravine, an earthquake trapped hundreds of tourists on a collapsing bridge. Flash fires burned in the area, and a tanker truck was washed away in a wall of water. Three minutes later, it happened again. They're calling it Catastrophe Canyon. We find out who, what, when, where, and how in this special report. It's an amalgam of classic movie disaster scenes. A raging titanic killer earthquake inferno force of no return. Shortened for convenience sake to Catastrophe Canyon. This is the movie where everything that can go wrong does. And the audience doesn't watch this movie. They live it. Oh, yeah, I think we've overdone it. <laughs> um, actually, the, uh, I think one of the things that we've discovered down here is that the, um, the overall effect of this, unlike uh, an iron ride, which is um, like a roller coaster ride, a ride that works on a thrill of speed or gravity, when you're sitting in the tram, the tram is rocking, and you hear the earthquake, and you look up at, the, up at the canyon, and you see an eight-foot high wall of water coming, rushing at you. Um, I think that your impulse as an animal is to flee, and when you can't do that, you're in the tram. It causes uh, just a nanosecond of panic, which is what we were hoping for. The Red Rock setting of Catastrophe Canyon is actually a complex 65,000 square foot grid work of steel screen cages overlaid with plaster and cement, then sculpted and painted to match the geology of the American Southwest. On Cat Canyon, we are going to try to convince people they are somewhere other than the state of Florida. They're out west. When the landscaping was completed, the props were moved into place. One of the biggest stunts in the Catastrophe Canyon show involves a five-ton tanker truck. The big rig was craned into position, then fixed to a system of hydraulic arms, which create the illusion of the tanker getting swept down the hillside in a torrent of water. The hydraulics then reposition the rig in time for the next show. This rock work is going to have to stand the impact of about 10,000 gallons of water in each canyon every three minutes. That's taking about a few million years of geology time putting it together in one week. Three, two, one, go. The final phase of testing on the attraction proved to be pretty thrilling itself. Every three and a half minutes, Catastrophe Canyon uncorks 71,000 gallons of water down the side of the mountain. And with the aid of an elaborate system of pumps and plumbing, this wall of water gets recycled back up to the top of the hill in time for the next tram. The fire effects that you see in here, the explosions, um, you know, we're having to use uh, propane. But if you use propane by itself, it's really not a visible flame. In the broad daylight, it'd be very difficult to see it. Um, so we have an additive, which is a high carbon additive, um, so that it looks like an oil fire, which is very red and very smoky. After the show, we take the guests backstage. We pull around backstage and let them watch the show recycle. We let them see all the support equipment and everything else. And it, backstage at Studio Tour is really backstage. We let them see everything. What makes those exciting things that you see more realistic is what you hear. Sound designer Joe Harrington has conjured up a world of sounds just as catastrophic as the canyon's visual effects. We'll hear the train trestle beginning to come apart, the metal tearing and wrenching, and the, and the wood splintering and the timbers falling, and those kinds of things. And we'll also hear the ground as it's shaking and rumbling. You can't overdo entertainment, and, uh, and I think we've been successful at that. If everything in Catastrophe Canyon goes wrong as planned, the Imagineers will succeed in creating that heart-stopping moment when it all seems real 205 times a day.
The Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular takes 20,000 visitors a day through a demonstration by the undersung crews and stunt performers who do the spectacular on an everyday basis. The show is designed for 2,000 seated per show, and right now we, we're uh, slated to do 10 shows a day on the most busy days of the year. The show was plotted and choreographed in true Raiders of the Lost Ark style. The heroes are in constant peril with no apparent way out. And an innocent looking ladder becomes the stuff of a hair raising stunt. We describe the action in these storyboards and pin them up on a wall like this. And in fact, this show is on about five big boards. And then we look at it and take the pictures and shuffle them around until we get the sequences in the way that we like them. The stunt spectacular depicts famous action sequences from the Indiana Jones films as they might be staged for the camera. The imagineering of the attraction called for scenes that could bowl over the audience 10 times a day. We've got steam starts rising out of the set and then just shortly after that, this whole face just explodes. Not quite like this. And uh, this big ball comes rolling out here. At this point, this is already sunk down. And Indiana Jones turns and runs away from the ball. The attraction was extensively tested, from storyboards to full-scale mock-ups. My concept, uh, which I developed with Bob McDonald, was to just do it like it really is, a real live ball. There's nothing simpler, there's nothing easier, just no maintenance problems, works every time, gravity still works all around the earth, even in Florida. The uh, Indiana Jones action adventure is full of all sorts of dramatic stunts and pyro effects and gas fire explosions and, and other dramatic uh, show action equipment. This is one of the most infamous aircraft in history. By the end of World War II, the Germans were working on a design for a tailless airplane, the Flying Wing. The design was resurrected in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Disney Imagineers spectacularized it even further so that this flying wing can circle out of control, fire its machine guns, and cause one stunt villain per show to disappear. In the completed stunt spectacular, the stunt performers demonstrate their death-defying ballet. It's a panorama of pyrotechnics and memorable movie action designed to bring out the Indiana Jones in everyone. It's an exciting show, no doubt about it. And it's also exciting because it's partly theatrical, it's partly uh, cinema, but it's also a combination of neither of those. It's an outdoor theater show which really doesn't exist as a form. And so it, it uh, presents us with some special problems that are quite exciting and quite challenging to, to figure out. You know, all the planning, designing, scoring, sketching, the building, programming, painting, etching, paving, and planting brought the Disney MGM Studios to life for the first time in May 1st, 1989. It was the kind of premiere that could only happen in Hollywood until now. The lights, the cameras, and the action were focused on Orlando for the studio's gala premiere. Good evening, movie fans! As he does every year at the Academy Awards, Hollywood columnist Army Archard acted as master of ceremonies and introduced some of the world's most popular stars to the black tie opening night VIP crowd. How are you? How are you? Well, the opening was uh, like a giant combination of, <laughs> of every part of show business you can think of because representatives were on hand from the, uh, from the early days of television to today's current stars such as Bette Midler. And of course, it had the great Disney magic. So you had movies, television, Disneyland, Disney World. I don't know what more you could have asked for. To suddenly see the, the Grauman's Chinese and the, all the ambiance of the Hollywood scene the way I remember it as a little kid, as opposed to what it has become now. So it's just holding it, it's frozen in time. It's lovely. We've been on these rides, which are literally incredible. incredible. How are you? Yeah. Oh, John. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kevin Costner! Let's say a wonderful welcome. How are can we, can we bring Cindy around, please? Can we let you introduce your family? Oh, this is my daughter, Anne, the one that could stay up this late. Hello, Anne. Hi. Are you happy to be here at Disney World? Yes. Oh, so glad, Anne, of course. This is my wife, Cindy, who, when I met her 15 years ago, was Snow White at Disneyland in Anaheim. For the opening of the Disney MGM Studio theme tour, 
the entire world became cognizant of show business and entertainment again. The media coverage is just unbelievable. And the excitement was not created not only for the Disney MGM studio theme tour, but for all of motion pictures and all of entertainment. A parade of celebrities, including Rick Moranis, film legend Lauren Bacall, and golden girl Betty White moved up Hollywood Boulevard toward the Chinese theater. Hollywood stars in all their finery, press representatives from around the world, and several thousand specially invited guests watched as Disney chairman Michael Eisner cut the ceremonial film strip. On behalf of the Walt Disney Company, I hereby declare the Disney MGM Studios theme park open. Let the magic begin. On May 1st, 1989, the park opened to the public. I think we got a good family here, right here. Okay. The Gutierrez family from York, Pennsylvania, got a day in the spotlight when they were selected as the theme park's first family and joined Michael Eisner, Mickey Mouse, and Bob Hope for a history-making stroll up Hollywood Boulevard. We're Gary's family from York, Pennsylvania, who's now the first family of Disney MGM walking down Hollywood Boulevard into the park. So, that's the story of how this remarkable new theme park came to be. How some very creative people built an avenue into our imaginations, where you can experience the magic of the movies as never before. <laughs> Fred! You, you forgot your hat! <sighs> well, with a little luck, some of that magic may rub off on you. Shall we? Air transportation provided by Delta Airlines, the official airline of Disneyland and Walt Disney World. Ground transportation provided by National Car Rental. Hotel accommodations provided by Walt Disney World Resorts.